Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul Podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul Podcast with John Morris. I'm excited. Okay, folks, and welcome to our first ever Mind, Body, and Soul uh, podcast. I guess you say I am John Morris, the painter of memories, and I am so excited today. Um, we're going to, well, our aim in doing these shows is literally to give you the best balance, inspiration, and motivation that we possibly can. And you're just going to absolutely love this. It's my pleasure to be here today and to welcome Gabe Nathan as well, an amazing human being. Um, who's very, very kindly given of his time to talk about suicide prevention today. We're going to have an amazing fun with a really, really difficult uh, conversation and really difficult topic, I I suppose, as well. Um, For those of you that don't know, Gabe is editor-chief in the OC87 Recovery Diaries and independent suicide awareness advocate as well. Gabe, it is my pleasure to have you on here today. How are you doing, sir? I'm I'm very very well, John. It's a, it's a privilege to be here and uh, and to do the work that I do. I wish I didn't have to do it, but I do love doing it. Um, and I guess one quick thing I wanted to say about it is, you know, you said we're we're gonna enjoy ourselves and have fun talking about a very serious topic. And and I I love that you said that because I am a very firm believer that. Speaking about suicide awareness and suicide prevention, yes, it is a very serious topic um, and it's very important to take it seriously, but it is also important to have lightness and, and joy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, I made a film about suicide awareness and we'll talk about that, but the film is silly and funny and quirky and it's okay. Like that, it doesn't, talking about this topic doesn't always have to be hanging the head down and morose yeah. and or just robotically reciting statistics and figures you can be a real human being and there's lots of different sides of being a human being when we talk about this stuff so thank you for saying that absolutely no it's a pleasure i mean uh, to, to give a little bit of my background as well i was a youth worker for gosh 15 years you know like yourself i've encountered many of the weird and wonderful personalities that this world is full of um And one of the things that I think was, you know, for for me, one of the biggest things that I could contribute was the gift of listening Um, and just being able, and and for kids and teenagers eventually, and I know we'll we'll unpack this a little bit this afternoon as well, um, kids and teenagers who were desperate to talk to someone, but to be able to do it in a safe environment. um, And obviously you've encountered a lot of different things as well. Gabe, I want to ask you, how did you get involved with suicide awareness? So just like there is no one reason why someone takes their own life, there's typically no one reason why someone gets into suicide awareness advocacy. Um, It's usually a a couple of different things um, and there can be a a sort of triggering event, but it's usually a mix. And and I'll tell you a couple different reasons why I got into this. So personally, um, I'm a suicide loss survivor. Um, My aunt, my father's sister killed herself in 2004. Um, She was living in Israel at the time. And she actually took her life at a psychiatric hospital uh, in Israel. And so uh, I, um, I was 24. Uh, when this happened, and I will never forget, I, I had my first big boy job. I was in an office with a door and you know a big desk and a phone, and and I'll never forget um, when you received calls at that office. A secretary patched the call in. She said, "You know, Mr. Nathan, I have a call from your mother," and she never called me at work ever, mm-hmm. so I knew something was weird. Um, and I saw that little red light on the phone, and I was like, "I, I don't want to." push that button for some reason. I don't want to connect this call. I don't know. I don't want to know what is on the other end of this. Um, and she told me that my aunt Rena had killed herself. 
and um, that my father was packing to go to Israel um, and that his other brother and sister were packing to, from Australia where they lived to go to Israel. And the last thing she said to me on the phone was, don't call dad. Wow. And um, so, you know, we get all these messages from social media and, yeah. and pop culture and from religion and from our parents, right? Mm -hmm. And so the message that I got from my mother, whether this was intentional or not, was what has happened is bad and wrong and don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, and don't reach out to the person to whom you most want to reach out to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, and I didn't, I didn't call him. Um, wow. And I was, I put the phone down and I was just like, you know, your brain is swimming, right? Yeah. With this news. And so anyway, you know, that, and I didn't talk to my father about this for 15 years, really. Um, and so, you know, having that kind of, sort of hang over over your family landscape that that changes you um from 2010 to 2015 i worked at a locked inpatient crisis psychiatric hospital um, with individuals who were suicidal homicidal unable to care for themselves day in and day out and that that leaves a mark on you um you know looking into people's eyes and talking to them about suicidality and, and seeing injuries that they have um, done against themselves, mm -hmm. that stays with you, right? And yeah. so that's part of the reason why I got into this as well. Um, and also my own, my own thoughts of suicide in, in college and, and having anxiety and depression and, and not really wanting to be here anymore at various points in my life. So all of those things sort of combined to me wanting to work to help give a voice um, or amplify the voices of lost survivors, attempt survivors, um, people who are struggling, and and really let people know that they're not alone. Absolutely, I mean, you know, uh, like I mean, that, that's a, that's a tough thing both to listen to and to to visualize what you must have been going through at the time. Um, went through something similar when I was a youth worker. I was doing, I was actually doing uh, lawn jobs and uh, gardening jobs for, for, for anyone who I could because youth work at, at that time paid very, very little. And I was doing any job that I could do before I went and, and ran business full time. And I remember doing one job for our minister. I was a church youth worker at one point. Um, and I loved exactly what you said there about the messages that people are fed. And, and I want to unpack that with you uh, big time. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it was one of the hardest things because, you know, I, my minister goes in to take a call and he says, don't go anywhere, boy. This, this you know, in, involves you too. And we found out that one of the, the youth group members, his mom, had committed suicide. And you just, I mean, that was the first time I ever experienced that. She'd been suffering with depression. Um, you know, in, in doing my research for this, you know, th there are obviously more men than women. And, and I do want to talk about that with you and to get your thoughts on that momentarily. But it was just, again, your sure. mind just swirls around and it's just, it, it's, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that this has actually happened. Um, what, what, I suppose the, 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 the follow on to that is suicide obviously is such a massive thing. Um, in the United States, not, not just the United States, but all, obviously all of the world, it seems to be hitting folks younger and younger and really targeting males. When I was doing my research for this, um, just in England and Wales alone, um, you know, overall, it's almost uh, triple from men committing suicide to women committing suicide. And again, younger and younger and younger, kids as young as 10 and, and 11. Oh, young, and, younger, younger. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's that. just... From your experience, what do you think is, is, I mean, I've got my own theories of this and my own feelings, but, but what do you think is, is causing, you know, men in particular at such a staggering rate to be, you know, losing all hope and taking their own lives? So, uh, all right. So there's a couple things I want to say about this and I'm, I'm organizing this in my brain here in terms of priority of what Good I want to say. I I, I, sometimes I speak, sometimes I speak faster than I think and then I lose things, <laughs> but okay. So in, in the United States, which is, that's my primary kind of frame of mind because that's where I, where I am. Men um, die by suicide three times as much as females. Yeah. And the reason why in the United States is because they use the most lethal means 
okay. um, which is firearms. Right. Um, so a firearm is going to kill you. Uh, it, it's going to be certainly the most lethal means possible, right? And that's what men in this country are using most. And that's why men are dying more than females. Females are attempting much more, right. but females tend to use less lethal means. So females, it's, it's unusual for a female to use a firearm. Uh -huh. um, they do do that. Um, and of course, when they do that, the chance of them dying by suicide is much more, yeah. but females tend to use um, uh, drugs, you know, uh -huh. prescription medication, and that is, is just not as lethal. Um, a suicide attempt by uh, pills is going to result in death about 4% of the time. Right. Fire firearms is, is 95%, right? Yeah. So that's, that's why we get that, that lethality um, schism, okay? Mm -hmm. If we think about why, why men are taking their lives, um, and again, there are, suicide is complex and it is multi-causal, but if we think about if we think about this word stigma and people throw this word out all the time and, and the stigma of mental health and the stigma of mental illness and the stigma of suicide. Well, let me put it another way. So you mentioned it in your intro that I'm editor in chief of OC87 Recovery Diaries. So what that is, is it's a publication that we publish essays by people with mental health challenges okay. and we make original short films. The essays we put out once a week, okay? Films once a month, but the, if I look at the makeup of who is writing these essays, these vulnerable, revealing essays about their mental health, it is overwhelmingly women. Yes, right. Because women from a very young age are encouraged to be vulnerable, to express themselves, to emote. Um, it's, a, it's a stereotypically feminine thing to speak about your uh, deeper thoughts. Mm -hmm. Men, we are not encouraged to yeah, do that. In fact, we absolutely. are discouraged from doing that. We are discouraged from crying. Buck up, be a man, yeah. you, know, uh, 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 you know, get on with it, shove on, you know, push on, repress stuff, um, particularly in English culture, if, oh, yeah. if I may, oh, yeah. right? No, um, I mean, my dad was so, exactly the same, that, yeah. That's a, that's a very English thing. And, uh, and you know, obviously, uh, we've got certain of those traits and characteristics that have passed on to, to Americans. And that's, in my opinion, that's one of them. This idea of stiff upper lip, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Don't, don't let on how you're really doing. Um, well, the, it's, the, embar it's embarrassing. But the other thing as well, I mean, my dad, I always remember, you know, standing on the landing, he grew up in a, and he went to a boarding school and him telling me directly, you know, you don't cry. It's a sign of weakness. You know, and, and yes. for a young kids, you know, that really does have a, a massive effect. So absolutely, regarding the cultures and things. Um, and I think that's probably a global thing as well now, examining all the cultures, certainly from yeah. a male society. And so the more you stuff and the more you repress yeah. and the more you're told, don't, don't emote, don't reveal... Um, don't let on. You're not going to talk about things. You're not going to go to therapy. You're not going to have very close, intimate, personal relationships where you feel comfortable being vulnerable with another yeah. male. Um, so where is all that stuff going to go? Yeah. Um, you know, you take a soda bottle and you shake it up. Eventually it's going to explode, right? Absolutely. So yeah. that's what I think we're seeing a lot with, with men. Mm -hmm. um, with younger people, you know, the 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 in in the united states the population um if the most is white middle-aged men mm -hmm. um, but we are seeing rates rise with youth and with minorities as well um and i think there's lots of reasons for that um if you look at um uh you know, uh, people of color in this country, we have so much racial injustice. We have a system that is, is stacked against people of color. Um, in this country, we have oppression. We have, it's systematic. It's on an individual basis as well. We also have in this country, um, black culture has this like pray it away idea, you know, um, and also, like, you don't talk about what happens at home. So if there's abuse going on in the home, you don't talk about it. You don't go to therapy. So all of those factors are weighing against people of color in this country. Um, with youth, you have social media, you have bullying, you have 
uh, early introduction to sex and drugs and all kinds of stuff. So yeah. it's, it's, it's really, um, it, it's a powder keg situation. And now you put the pandemic into that. Yep. And um, I feel like in the next year or two, and this is just my own personal opinion, we're going to be seeing very shocking, terrifying numbers worldwide. I... When we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we find out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations. To tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face a Devotional with a Difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know so whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in it and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself, as long as you're drawing breath, to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below, and I'll see you on the other side. I, I would tend to agree. Uh, the other thing that I want to throw in there as well, Gabe, is people um, of, of, of our age, basically, because I don't think we're going to be too far away age-wise. Um, and I don't know. Look at look at all this gray here. I don't, you don't you don't look this age to me, but whatever. We'll leave that. I've got a wonderful app that basically uh, touches up everything. So so that's why. It, and it's really you can send that to me after the show. Thank you. <laughs> But um, one thing that I was going to throw out there is people's working environment. Before doing this, as I said, I was a youth worker, had to deal with a lot of politics, a lot of heavy duty stuff, and a lot of expectations nowadays. It seems to be that people expect more now than they ever have in the past. Um, when I left my youth work position, gosh, I left with so much baggage from PTSD and eventually BPD, uh, borderline uh, personality disorder, um, you know, because of the stress, because yeah. of this and that. Yeah. And it's amazing on how it really affects people. Going back to what you were saying about, you know, pray it away. Um, I think I was one of the, the uh, I don't know if I was the first, but certainly one of the few uh, modern youth workers that wasn't a case of preach, preach, preach. It was a case of, I want to actually know what's going on in your life right now. Because if you want, you know, a genuine relationship with God, don't you think he's interested, you know, if, in that relationship and, and knowing actually what's going on as opposed to the, the phony, right. you know, you got to do this, you got to do that kind of stuff, which just drives me absolutely insane. 
And the sad thing was the day that I left my youth work position, I remember saying to the folks, it's like, look, this is on you now. If, if, if this is going to succeed, you need to continue right. what I've started with listening to people. Um, and the sad thing was they didn't. I heard a couple of weeks later, they were literally back, you know, talking about what they want to talk about and so on and so on and so on. Um, you know, we had a, a youth group that was, you know, for them, the biggest battles was their sexual identity, whether or not they were boy or girl, whether or not they were lesbian, gay, homos homosexual, every everything else that was there. Um, and obviously now that list has grown on and on and on, which I think really adds to the stress. Um, because what, I suppose one of the things that, you know, I, I kind of want to touch on with you and get your thoughts. I know there's this whole thing about the millennials in particular, um, that I know bits and pieces about that, but one of the, one, it's not even a question. It was more just a, a statement that people had made. And I'd found in myself when people had said the world that I grew up in, in the eighties and nineties now no longer exists. Where do I find my place in society? And I think that's got to add to obviously why people are saying, I, I got I got to check out of here. I can't do this anymore. Right, right. Well, and if that world doesn't exist anymore, and I think that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm a I'm a child of the of the '80s, um, the Reagan era, or the Thatcher era, whatever era. Yes. And, and I think that we. So when I, I'll tell you a quick little story. So when I took my um, when I made my film, um, it's called A Beautiful Day Tomorrow, taking suicide awareness on the road, and I took my. Herbie the Love Bug replica, which we'll talk about later, that has the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number all over the back. I took it on a East Coast uh, road trip up and up and down the East Coast of the United States. And one of the stops I made was at Cornell University. And Cornell is notorious, unfortunately, for suicides on their campus. Um, and I went to the health center to talk to the counseling um, folk and they wouldn't speak to me on camera but a few students did and you know I'm just about 20 years removed from my college experience mm -hmm. and when I spoke to these students about suicide and warning signs and they've taken um, this course that taught them how to ask a question if they're concerned about someone and they knew so much and they were so, um, so much more emotionally evolved yeah. and and articulate than uh, related to mental health matters than I was at that age. And that that anybody who I knew at that time, um, back and I went to college ninety eight through two thousand and two. So people want to take a shit on millennials and 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 make fun of them and oh well they're so emo and and they just they're so entitled and they every generation has its problems okay but what i do want to say about the millennial generation is they are emotionally in touch they are emotionally intelligent yeah they are emotionally available they are listening to each other and they are taking care of each other in a way that we never did Absolutely. um and I just think that is extraordinary. And it, it really, I don't have much hope for, for much, um, but I do have hope for this next generation and the children that they will have yeah. um, because they will imbue them with those characteristics and traits and their children will be even more emotionally evolved. That's, and I think that we need so much more of that. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think one of the things, um, to, and again, like you say, you know, a lot of people want to dump all of the millennials, but one of the things that they do, I think probably better than anyone in the previous generations is actually talk about, you know, hey, I'm feeling like this. Hey, I've got this going on. Because they probably looked at the, the yeah. kids from the 90s and the 80s and said, uh, we don't want to end up like them. You know, we want to at least be, be right. honest. And, and I'm not a big advocate for you know, needing to share everything about my life, you know, all of the social yeah. media and stuff. Um, you know, there are people that do that and that's fine. That's just, it's just, it's just a different view of the Rubik's cube. Um, right. But the way that, you know, they are doing so many things right now and you look at the different charities and the movements that are out there now. Um, I've got an opportunity to speak with a lady called Tamika Sheldon very, very soon about Black Lives Matter. And she is such a passionate, um, a, a very dear friend of mine. She has been for over a decade, but she's so passionate about what she's doing and you know again i think there is going to be a lot of change that happens and i think for a lot of us like every you know period in our lives it's got to be the adjustment as well that's there 
Right. And, and I think there are people who feel threatened um, by change. Yeah. And I think that if you feel threatened, I, th I think the best thing that you can do is sit with that and think about why. Yeah. Why do you feel threatened by the fact that someone doesn't know if they're a boy or a girl? What does that have to do with you? Exactly. And, and maybe, maybe ponder the fact that maybe your discomfort has more to do with you than it has to do with that other person. Yeah. Um, you know, and if we think about rates of suicidal behavior or suicidal ideation in individuals in the trans community, um, in the LGBTQIA community, um, they are very, very high. Yeah. And part of the reason they are very high is because they're not accepted by their families. They're not accepted by society or their friends. They have difficulty finding work. They, they have difficulty even finding romantic partners yeah. um, because mainstream dating sites don't know what the hell to do with these people. Yeah. And so they're in this, this world where they're, they're confused on the inside and they're rejected on the outside. So if maybe we were a little bit more accepting, a little bit more open, um, we could see those numbers drop. I completely agree. And I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a conversation I've had several people since I've left the church youth work scene have come forward to me that I'd worked with for years and said, hey, you know, I'm gay or I'm lesbian or I'm bi or I'm going through the change from, you know, boy to girl or, or man to woman, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and, and the amount of times, you know, years ago, again, talking about the whole thing of how we're conditioned, I was almost programmed that, you know, again, from a traditional church of Scotland um, point of view, that it was a case of, no, we don't accept that, that's terrible. And I was one of the first youth workers, that, and it, not to blow my own horn, but again, I just thought if that was me in that position, you know, how much would I want the support? But secondly, nobody sits there and right. asks and says, hey, I want to be gay. And, and one of the guys that came out to me has been one of my dear friends, he still is to this day. And he told me, he said, I didn't ask to be this way. And I agonized over it for years. Right. And I'm still not right. open, you know, with my family and with society. And, and he told me in confidence. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's heartbreaking in, in some ways to see the other side, as, as you say, of the coin, where, okay, you know, the, the majority of people will say, oh, well, that's terrible. How could they do that? But looking at on the other side, it's like, well, hang on a second you know, they're human as well, you know, that they're, they're, you know, yes. yeah. there's all these things that are going on in them. Um, and as you say, when you rejected them by your society and everything else and basically put into exile, it's like, well, who the heck do you trust? And thankfully now there's all these different communities around right. that are helping so many people. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and I, I, when you, when you mentioned the whole thing about, I didn't ask to be this way, it's like, who, who would, who would say, <laughs> I'm going to choose to have my life be extremely hard. Like it's very, it's, I can tell you as a white heterosexual cis male, it's, I have a pretty, I have it pretty easy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I walk down the street with my wife and I hold her hand and yeah. no one says anything to me and I can go to, I can go to synagogue and no one says anything and I can, and so who would say, I want my life to be really fucking hard and I want people to, I, I'm going to choose to have my family reject me and I'm going to choose to be a societal outcast. Nobody would choose that. Okay. Well, the, the um, that I have so been... it, it's just, it's, Sorry, I was just, just going to say the conversation I had the other day was a guy who, you know, felt he was no, more go ahead. female in, in gender and things, and he would dress like a woman. And I believe he's from Philadelphia, if my memory serves me correctly. And basically, he was smacked in the face and punched in the face three or four times and basically told he was a scum of the earth and things like that. Nobody has the right, no matter what you do, nobody has the right to, to, to assault somebody else or to do anything regardless of how they're dressing or, or you know, I, I don't get it. And um, right. it shows a real, and, and I mean, he did say to me, you know, they were, what, what, I chuckled at this and I probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, I quote, you know, there were Southern hillbillies um, that basically, you know, were really stuck in their ways. And it, it's just sad that people would behave like that because they have been conditioned in that way. Right. And, and my, I guess my bottom line is if you don't like what, if you don't like 
men dressing up as women or if you don't like women being with women, don't do it. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. But you have no, it's none of your business what anyone else does or thinks or who anyone else loves or who anyone else wants to have sex with. It, it has nothing to do with you. And if we can just let go of that idea that we have something to say about other people, then we'd all be much better off. If you don't like it, don't do it. Yeah. You don't like abortion, don't have one. You don't like gay yeah. marriage, don't have one. Yeah, that's absolutely. All. Absolutely. I mean, one of the teachings that I, I think has, has gone on to be one of my most successful is, is about the Rubik's Cube and all from perspective. And if you imagine people, you're basically stuck, stuck where you are. I don't have my Rubik's Cube near, near me. It's, it's a square one. Um, that's a nightmare to do. And you've basically you're locked in all these different positions and all you can see is right in front of you. Well, if you spoke to the person on the left or the right or above, you know, you would have so much more of a clear overall picture of what right. people are going through. Right. While we're talking about that, Gabe, I've got to ask you, what is the connection between uh, suicide prevention and Herbie? Ah, okay. So for those, for those of your, um, your viewers who don't know, um, oh, hold on, I'm getting a, a FedEx package. Okay. That's, ex <laughs> that's exciting. Hold on one second. Hello. Hello. How are you? Thanks so much. Life can be, folks. Take care. That's so exciting. Um, okay, so the love bug, which is depicted in that beautiful piece of artwork behind you, is a, a uh, 1969 film by the Walt Disney Company, which features uh, a, a white, off-white, 1963 VW Beetle um, with a mind and heart of its own, named Herbie. And um, I... I first saw this film when I was five years old. It was 1985, and actually my Aunt Rena, um, my father's sister who took her a life, she was visiting America very briefly, and she was babysitting me, and she rented uh, The Love Bug. I had never seen it before. And I watched it on the floor of our living room with Rena, and I just, I mean, my brain just completely broke um, when I saw this absolutely magical film about this lovely little car um, winning over hearts and minds and winning races against Ferraris and Jaguars and Lamborghinis. And I, I mean, I was just gone, right? So in the film, Herbie is owned by uh, uh, the character Jim Douglas, who's played by the, the wonderful Dean Jones. Amazing man. And he, he, is, he is to die for. Um, and so in the film, um, towards, towards the end, uh, Dean... Uh, kind of forsakes Herbie. He buys a red Lamborghini to replace Herbie. And Herbie is so angry and jealous. And he just rams into this Lamborghini over and over and over. He beats the shit out of this <laughs> car. Uh, the first night that Jim brings it home. And Herbie flees by himself. He drives um, away um, in the streets of San Francisco, the foggy San Francisco streets, and, and that's where Jim Douglas finally realizes that Herbie is is alive and yeah. and that he needs him. Um, and so Jim goes and, and chases Herbie through the streets, calling to him, and he finally finds Herbie half hanging over the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and the symbolism of of dangling over the Golden Golden Gate Bridge is not lost on, on anyone who knows anything about suicide prevention in America. The, the Golden Gate Bridge is the, the suicide hotspot in this country. Um, there are thousands of attempts every year. The California Highway Patrol has um, a unit that is dedicated to solely to preventing suicides on the Golden Gate Bridge. It's, it's uh, amazing. But anyway, Dean Jones runs over to Herbie and, and hangs on his rear bumper and he screams, no, Herbie, don't. And he's, he's holding on to him as Herbie's revving his engine, trying to push himself over the bridge. Um, and Jim finally convinces Herbie to not do it. And he says, come on, baby, it's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. And, um, and that's the title of my film, A Beautiful Day Tomorrow, mm -hmm. taken from that scene. And so, you know, when I was five, I didn't, it didn't connect that this was a suicide attempt yeah. like that. It was just like a Herbie's trying to get away from Jim and Jim is trying to pull him back. And, but watching that film as an adult and watching it as, um, 
someone who experienced suicide loss in his family and, and who knows a lot more. And, and you're like, my breath was just taken away watching this very dark and stirring scene. And so I knew when I got my own Herbie um, and that, uh, that I wanted to use him for, to spread awareness of, of the lifeline mm -hmm. and to have conversations with people about suicide prevention and so that's what I did. I mean, I, I put the number all over the back of his, the car and it says uh, stop suicide now on the back. And, and so when I fill up petrol, as you call it, or gas, as we, as we call it, when I, when I fill up or I go to the supermarket or, or go on little errands, people stop me and we talk. And sometimes a 15 minute errand takes me an hour because I have a very long conversation with someone who has a story to tell and um i i love that i love driving and having someone behind me take and i see the cell phone rise up and they take a picture of the rear window and and i don't know their story and they don't know mine um but i know that that message is being spread uh, and i i love that it's, that's it, what we do it really is incredible i mean you know again I think it's only when, when you point it out the way that you have so eloquently, um, you know, that so Herbie is basically, he can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. He's like, yeah. you know, I've been abandoned by the one I thought that loved me and this is it. Um, yeah. You know, and it's, I mean, the, the folks, if you haven't seen the film, because I know we're going to have a lot of people on here, because again, for whatever reason, nowadays, all these old films, you know, a lot of the time, they, they sort of, you know, fit into the annals of history and things. And, you know, yeah. if you haven't seen Herbie the Love Bug or Herbie, you know, any of the Herbie series, I would definitely re recommend you go out of your way. You can get them on Amazon. Definitely check them out because they are really heartwarming just emotionally amazing films. And I or like, you, can, you can sign up for Disney Plus for seven days and then cancel it Absolutely. after you've seen them all. <laughs> Absolutely. But I mean, I totally agree with you because Herbie, um, I know we didn't talk about this before, but Herbie was my favorite film, probably still is overall as a child. And I would watch it over and over and over again. I loved it. I think it's probably where I fell in love with the mountains and the forest and the, the landscape mm -hmm. as well. Um, and just, again, like you said, this sweet, innocent, pure... I don't even know what you'd call it, but the purity that came from Herbie was just so amazing. And there's so many hidden messages that as, as an artist, you always look for the yeah. meaning in things, um, you know, and, you know, m the follow-up to that for me was certainly Herbie goes to Monte Carlo. Cause again, it was more of the race. It was more of the drama that was there uh, and the oh, yeah. story that was being told. Um, but again, the original was just phenomenal. And obviously played by Dean Jones, who was a, a wonderful human being and unfortunately had his battles with alcoholism as, you know, and, uh, and had a lot of battles in his own life as well. But also, but also found faith and redemption. Absolutely. And, uh, and that's a very important part of his story. And, uh, uh, you know, very few people know about this, but David Tomlinson, mm -hmm. the brilliant Amazing man. character actor, um, who most people know as Mr. Banks um, from Mary Poppins, <laughs> yes. but he was he was the the delicious villain Peter Thorndike yep. in The Love Bug. Uh, David Tomlinson is a, is a suicide was a suicide loss survivor. Um, wow. His first wife, um, which this was back during World War II, um, wow. took her took her own life along with the lives of her two sons wow. um, from her first marriage. Um, and you know he was in the war when he got this telegram oh, and. Lord utterly devastated um he had just married her they were very young and uh, and then very much later on in his life lost his brother to suicide um so you know when when you think about how suicide touches people um i think it's 20 percent of people will have a suicide in their close family 60 percent of people at some point in their lives will know someone in their inner circle whether it's extended family or, or friends or colleagues um, who've taken their own life um, it, it touches so many people in in so many different ways um, and it's uh it's in that film and it's, it's in those, those actors. Um, it's, it's in their lives. Buddy Hackett yeah. um, in the film uh, had bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bouts of mania and bouts of severe depression. So mental health challenges, 
it's so easy to feel alone. Yeah. Um, I think, and yet it's, it's amazing. You know, the national Alliance of mental illness puts out these statistics of one in three or one in four or one in five, whether it's one in three or one in four or one in five, it's so ubiquitous. There are so many people out there struggling. Um, you don't have to feel alone and you don't have to feel aberrant or weird, um, or, or, terrified if you have a suicidal thought that's normal yeah that is part of the yeah. normal human condition to think about that it's just not normal to stay there yeah um and so if you if you find yourself staying there um two things reach out um to a, a suicide hotline to a crisis counselor um to a friend that you trust to a family member, to a colleague, whoever you have in your life that you know is open and, and willing to hear whatever you have to say. The other side of that is, we, I think we do a disservice in the suicide prevention community when we tell people, reach out, reach out, reach out, reach out. When unfortunately, when people are in that situation, they can't. So the flip side of that is reach in. Yeah, I, I wanna tell everyone, Think about the people in your world and in your life um, who may be exhibiting warning signs, and, and I'll go over what those are, or who may not be. Reach in. Just let people know you love them. Yeah. Um, I, I was on a walk yesterday, and someone popped into my brain, and I just pulled out my phone, and I said, hey, you just popped into my brain right now. How are you doing? That's all. She, she wasn't exhibiting any signs or, or anything. You just make such I just wanted to let her, yeah. I just wanted to let her know that I was thinking about her. And that's a really wonderful thing that you can do for another human being. So don't forget to reach in. Also, it's not all about just telling people to reach out and call the hotline and do this and do that. When you're doing well, you have work to do too with the people in your life. Yeah. Um, so real quick, I just want to go over warning yeah, yeah, signs. Please do, please do. So there are, are certain behaviors, and, and because we're in a pandemic, a lot of these are online behaviors that you can look for in people. Um, if people are posting kind of dark stuff online, um, people are talking about how depressed they are, and they, you know, everything seems so hopeless and bleak, and it, it does now. Um, but if people are posting stuff like that, and that's uncharacteristic for them, that might be something that you might want to look into. Hey, I've been noticing that you're posting some kind of dark stuff. Can we talk about that? Um, behavioral changes, sleeping a lot more than usual, um, sleeping a lot less than usual, eating a lot less, um, skipping meals, eating more than usual, sudden interest in religion, sudden loss of interest in religion, um, moodiness, uh, anxiety, irritability, um, or a sudden euphoria. Yeah. Someone has been down recently for a period of time and gosh, all of a sudden they seem light and that can be deceptive because that can deceive you into thinking, wow, they're, they're doing much better now. However, this is like a, a, a classic under the radar warning sign that someone might be preparing to take their life because they've been in this dark place and they've made their decision. Yeah. Now all of a sudden they found And now it, it, things don't matter anymore, right? So there's nothing to really be dark about. So if someone seems to be doing really well after a period of not doing well, that's a time to check in on them. Um, that's troublesome. Then there are the situational things that can happen that can be warning signs. Loss of a relationship, um, loss of a job, loss of uh, potential loss of freedom. Someone might be facing incarceration, um, losing housing. Uh, financial instability. Um, there, there are all those things. Recent acquisition of lethal means. Okay. Hey, what did you do today? Oh, well, you know, I just, I uh, did a couple of errands and, and I also, I, you know, I went to a gun shop and I just picked up a 38, you know, at, really? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, acquisition of lethal means is, is a huge warning sign. Um, someone kind of stockpiling medication. So there are all these things that you want to look for. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, and we touched on this really briefly early in the talk about listening. 
Yes. I think sometimes when we talk about suicide prevention, people are so scared and they're like, well, what do I say? Mm-hmm. It, it's a strange why not focus thing, on, yeah. but, but why not focus on not saying much? <laughs> Start out with, I'm, I'm concerned about you. I've noticed X, Y, and Z behavior. And then just shut up and listen. Yeah. I would say 90% of, of this conversation should be you not saying anything. Yeah. Um, and letting the other person talk um, and really just taking in everything that they're saying um, because once you crack that door open a little bit, you might be the only person who has asked that question. Hey, are you thinking about killing yourself? Um, and so be prepared for a, be prepared for them to say yes. And that's not the end of the world. That's actually the beginning. Yeah. Um, and, and just be prepared to listen. I mean, the, the, you know, the, everything that you touched on there was, you know, absolutely fantastic. And it is, I mean, you know, I think back, you know, to conversations that I had myself where people have said, you know, I think one person in particular, you know, they were going through so many things at that time that I knew nothing about. And, you know, I responded it to a very, very different way to what I would now. Um, and again, you know, all of us, I think, can say, you know, I wish I'd said the right thing. I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. Yeah. You know, we grow, we, well, hopefully we grow, we learn, we develop. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I am glad you touched on there, um, briefly was about medication because sometimes folks, you can be on a medication and I can speak personally to this and Gabe, you may be able to as well, you know, and it may be for long-term, you know, illness. I, I suffer with colitis. I was, you know, wrongly misdiagnosed. I was put on a medication that damn near ended my life, you know, it, and it caused a number of issues with jobs and, and all this, that, and the other. And unfortunately yeah. Yeah. people were not accepting of that. Um, you know, and that was part and parcel of the reason I went, you know, self-employed and, and I do everything that I do now. Um, you know, so, so be aware as well. Have somebody watching you that's saying, you know, is your personality changing a lot? Because it's only when I got with my wife and I was on this medication that she realized uh, this guy's either completely, utterly bloody loopy or, you know, that, you know, that it, it didn't match up. Um, you know, and it's taken years to, to actually get that medication out of my system because it was, you know, it was a very, very powerful one. Um, you know, and, and doctors would just turn around and say, well, you know, th- this is just a normal thing of what we, pre- right. what we prescribe. And I'm like, well, it might be, but this affects me in quite a severe way. Gabe, I want to touch on with you as well. Um, because I know, you know, I know you're really busy today, but two things I want to touch on with you is, is some of your own battles, if it's okay to ask some of your own battles. Yeah with uh with, with mental um how, how would you want to phrase it not mental illness but mental oh i'm not fussy i don't care you can call it whatever you want mental and look people say mental illness people say brain disease people say mental health challenges i don't give a fuck i'm not you know it, i look so i um so i live with anxiety and depression and obsessive compulsive tendencies not full-blown ocd but definitely obsessive compulsive tendencies you and, and i have very and much some of the <laughs> some of the creative endeavors that i have that i have undertaken i think have been a, a manifestation of those herbie included um the road trip the film included i i obsess over these things and then the compulsion is i must do this thing whatever yeah. it is and so it's nice it's led to some really nice things it's also led to some not nice things um but i can say without fear of, of contradiction that I have lived with, you know, these things since I was a very, very young child. And I was a very anxious child. I would chew pencils until they were like dust. Um, My eyeglass uh, temples, I mean, just gnaw on them endlessly, chewing my fingernails off to the point where I got pinworms is really gross because you have this you know, dirt underneath your fingernails and when you're chewing it, that's getting into you and there's bacteria. So anyway, that's, that's nasty. Um, I hope you're not like eating <laughs> while you're watching this uh, folks. But um, I, I, uh, I remember as a child, you know, going to my mother and saying, I need to talk to someone. And my mother's response, and this is not like shit on Gabe's mother no. time. You know, she's, she was doing the best she could at, with what she had, but she said, oh, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're, yeah. you're fine. And I was very clearly not fine. Um, and so I think that there was a stigma in our home about like, and there still is like, you don't talk about X, Y, and Z thing and, and you know, everything is fine. Um, 
So I didn't go see a therapist until I was in college when I didn't have to ask anyone for permission. I could just go. Um, And I was in counseling for three of my four years in college. Um, I was referred to a psychiatrist in college um, to go on medication. I was very resistant to that and I did not take medication in college. Um, I think it would have really helped in retrospect. Um, And then I didn't go back to therapy until 2010 when I started working at the psychiatric hospital and I had worked there for maybe two months and I was absolutely losing my mind. Um, I was restraining patients to beds and I was tackling patients to the floor and witnessing assaults and listening to things and, and seeing things that I was not equipped to handle. Um, and I went to therapy, uh, you know, really two months after working on the unit and I have not stopped since I've been seeing the same therapist for 10 years. Um, and, uh, hold please. It's my (laughs) child. Um, and so a lot of the work that I have been doing in therapy has been addressing cognitive distortions that my message, negative messages that my brain tells me that you're bad and evil and malevolent and that the things that you do are attention seeking and that you're uh, a phony and a fraud and a, a con man, whatever, you know, awful thing. I, I mean, it's, it's a form of self abuse. Um, those negative messages. And then a lot of, a lot of the work I do is, is, is trying to reprogram my brain or counter those messages yeah. for peaceful internal monologue. Um, so that's, that's my sort of mental health work that I do uh, for myself, really. I mean, that, that's really helpful because, again, you know, I've, I've just finished writing a new book called The Battles That We All Face. It touches on a lot of these different things, whether it be anxiety, as you say, whether it be OCD or, you know, and, and it, it's through my own experience in the last decade. And one of the things that I have found through my journey is there are so many people going through the same thing, maybe in different situations as a teacher or as a nurse or as, as a medical practitioner or whatever, um you know and their stories are all similar of you know i did this i did that i did the other um the amount of times honestly since i left youth work four years ago that my my friends and family had said gee john i think you'd really do well going to see a therapist now i've got a negative connotation to a therapist because when i went when i was in college and i was studying for my degree in business um you know i I went to see a therapist and I, i went to see her twice First week was opening up and doing the introduction. Second week was her shouting at me, telling me I hadn't made any progress. And basically I was just telling her the same thing that I told her the last week. I left there probably suicidal (laughs) and damn sure miserable as a a 17 year old teenager or whatever it was. And I was, I vowed that day, I was like, I will never go back to another therapist again. I've got friends that go to therapy, um, you know, and again, they always say it's about finding the right person. and, and I frequently laugh about it in, in some ways because the amount of live streams that I've done, whether it be as a, um, you know, as a sermon or a pre, you know, preacher or whatever you want to call it, or live streams just where you're talking. And I, I see myself when I was at my worst and, you know, n- not behaving or acting out on, because I've always had this thing professionally, whenever I'm doing live streams, I will always be on and I can always do my job. But, you know, sometimes you'd sit there yes. with a can of cider and you're like, cheers to you, folks. Let's have some fun, you know. Um, other times, you know, and, and nowadays, I mean, doing these things and these, you know, podcasts and things, it, it's a source of just this release and this book, um, you, know, as, as, you know, has gone on to help many people. And I think it will go on to many people as well. Um, well, well, you mentioned as well, you uh, your work in the psychiatric hospital. I mean, you must have some stories to tell from there that you've seen personally um in, in the time that you've had there uh yeah um i uh, so i resigned in august of 2015 and so we're in september of 2020 mm-hmm. and i can honestly tell you that there is not a day not a single day 
that I don't remember um, whether I want to or not. Um, moments, uh, faces um, where I don't hear the panic bell um, when there's an assault in progress, we had these little buttons on the wall that you'd hit the button. And if you've ever seen Ghostbusters, yes. the panic bell sounds like uh, Ecto-1 siren. Um, <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like. And I, I hear it wow. sometimes at night when I'm closing my eyes. Um, I remember uh, my assault uh, during an escape attempt. Uh, I was the only staff member there and I, I see it um, happening. And I like I feel hands yeah. on me. Um, you don't. Uh, the day I left, I had lunch with a woman named Berta Britz, and Berta is a voice hearer. That's how she identifies as as someone who hears voices. Mm -hmm. And Berta was hospitalized for much of her youth, and she. Um, recovered to the point where she became a tremendous mental health advocate. And she actually ran groups at our hospital and she would come to the hospital and run groups. Sometimes she ran them with me, sometimes with other folks. And Berta and I became friends and, and Berta's maybe God, like 70 by now. But on the last day of work, Berta took me out for lunch at a Vietnamese restaurant. And we were sitting there with our banh mi and um, she was talking to me about what I was going to do next now that I was leaving the hospital and everything. And, and um, she looked into my eyes and she said to me, you know, um, I want you to know something. Nobody gets out of that place unscathed, mm -hmm. not patient, not staff. It doesn't matter whether you're there for five days or five years or 15 years. Nobody gets out unscathed that place is going to stay with you forever and um obviously she was right yeah. and it's funny that nobody tells you that during your orientation yeah. on your on your first day while they're, while they're teaching you about takedown maneuvers and and therapeutic holds and about medications and what they do and different mental illnesses and um you know, all of that stuff that they teach you how to clock in and how to clock out and, and how to document and all of that. Nobody tells you um, that this is never going to leave. Um, and I guess if they did, nobody would work there. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, the thoughts that was going through my head there. <laughs> but, and, and we do have like at, at every orientation, there are people who, who don't stay um, for orientation. Like, or sometimes they go to lunch and they leave their keys and they don't come back. Um, and this is even before going onto the actual unit. Wow. So, but I think, I think that when I think about trauma and PTSD and the things that stay, um, maybe they're supposed to, mm -hmm. maybe there are some things that we're not supposed to forget. And maybe we're not supposed to forget Herbie dangling off that bridge. And maybe we're not supposed to forget rolling around on the, on the tile floor with a patient. And maybe we're not supposed to forget the look of a 25 year old bipolar woman who says in a group, I always thought I was alone until I was brought here. Um, maybe that's supposed to stay with you. And maybe that's supposed to help make you a more nuanced and empathic person. Um, and if that, I gained a lot from working there and I lost a lot. Um, but if, if it's helped me be a better human being, then I don't regret a day of it, really. That's, that's really amazing. And it's, again, it's comforting to hear that you've you know, gone through that as well. I think oftentimes when you've got a caring heart and, and you are more of an empath, um, you know, I think we, we forget a lot of the times the impact that we make on other people's lives, but I think we often forget the impact they make on our lives. Because for so long as a youth worker, I mean, I was involved with their lives all the time. I was the one that would get the call, you know, from a child when they're going through all chaos and all crap's hitting the fan and everything. And, and for so long after I left, it was, you know, um, you, you would see their faces, you would, you would remember them, you'd remember their stories and everything that's there. Um, and, and, and like you say, it's difficult. And, and I think one of my struggles was when they kept changing the rules like over here, it's, a, it's an organization called OSCAR, which basically dictates 
um, you know, what you can do as a youth worker, what you can't. So for example, if you, if you were to get a call at midnight saying, my dad is going absolutely crazy here, um, I need help. You'd say, sorry, son, you need to, you know, hang up, don't call me, but call, you know, and I just couldn't do that because that's not in my nature. Um, right. but, but unfortunately, as you say, it, 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 it's very difficult. And I think wherever you are, if, again, regardless of how long you're there, it does leave, you know, an, an imprint on your heart. And, and, and like you say, I think it should um, in, in some yeah. ways as well, uh, because it makes you, it makes you human, you know, yeah. nothing else. And that's, that's what we need to be in this world, more, more human. That's a good way of putting it. Gabe, is there anything else that you want to touch on that we haven't touched on? Anything that springs to your mind? I, no, I'm just so grateful to be here and to have had this conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted. So thank you for having it's me. It's been an absolute blast. I really appreciate it. Where can folks find you, Gabe, if, uh, if they want to reach out to you on social media? Well, I'm, oh, on social media. I was going to say I'm on my porch. Come and say <laughs> hi. Um, but uh, on, on social media, I'm on Instagram at lovebugtrumpshate. And yes, that is political for those of you who are curious. <laughs> um, you can also find of my Instagram account and at a beautiful day tomorrow.com. Um, there, there's information about the man, the car, the film, and also resources for suicide loss survivors, attempt survivors, and, and people who are struggling. Uh, all there at a beautiful day tomorrow.com. That's really, really fantastic. And Gabe, is there anything that you want to say to the viewers just before we wrap up here today? Uh, I just want to say that this is a really shitty time, friends. Um, but we've lived through shitty times before and there are better days ahead. And I just keep going, get through this however you can. Um, and just recognize that while this situation is different for everyone, um, everyone is struggling. Um, so be human, be compassionate with other people and, and with yourself. And that's brilliant advice. And, and folks, I'm going to do a cheap plug here. You can come and check my new book out at thebattleswefaced.com. Uh, it's a devotional with a difference. We want you to think about the topics and everything that's there. We don't just want you to pick up and read page one and then just zoom through it really quickly because it's a very thin book. But the content that's in there is really loaded. And it will honestly have a major impact on your life because it's written by someone that's actually lived it, which is always really exciting as well. You can also come and visit me at johnmorrisartfromtheheart.com. And if you type in John Morris Art from the Heart anywhere on Google, I guarantee you'll find me somewhere. Um, so we want to thank Gabe for his time and amazing work that he does. Thank you so much for all that you do and for having the conversations and, and being that person to take the time to be so selfless and actually do that as well. And it's, it's an incredible thing. And if you're looking for inspiration, folks, go and watch Herbie. <laughs> Tonight, Disney Plus. Don't forget to cancel it. That's it. We're going to have a Herbie Marathon. Now, why not? That's right. Gabe, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. We're going to stop the recording there. I really... And really folks, do. of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. If you've enjoyed this video, tell a friend. It could be the very thing that helps them and even saves them. Let us know if you have any questions in the comment section below. And until next time, this has been the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. I've been your host, John Morris. He's been the awesome Gabe Nathan, and we'll see you next time.